Welcome to Wine for Bet Street, episode 24, X is for Chirello. Chirello is a Spanish grape, mostly found in cava, but what you'll find in this episode, it's done in numerous ways. It's produced as an orange wine, it's produced as a blending wine in cava, a still wine, and a late harvest wine. So sit down, relax, and enjoy this episode. Welcome to Uncork Your Mind, where we take the intimidation out of wine with your host, Debbie Giaquindo, the Hudson Valley wine goddess. Hey! Hey! (laughs) We are live! We are live! Welcome to another episode of Wine for Bed Street. It is so difficult to believe that we are in our second season and we are up to the letter X already. And we have a special episode for everybody today. We are talking Charello. And I'm so excited because I know this much about it. Uh, and other than the fact that it's found in Cava, but we are going to talk about the whole range that Charello can offer people in the glass. And we have two special guests with us, and I'm going to give them a brief second to introduce themselves. So Rick, you want to go first? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, My name is Rick Fisher. I am the Spanish Programs Director for the Wine Scholar Guild. Okay. And we have Ignace, who thankfully and graciously is up at nine o'clock at night (laughs) to, (laughs) to join us. So Ignace, how about you give a little introduction? Then my name is Ignacio Segui. I am a vine grower and winemaker in the Penedès wine region that's placed close to Barcelona, in the south of Barcelona, in the middle of the Cava region. And where Chirello is home, right? That is the home of yeah. Chirello. Okay. And Deb, how about you? And I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm known as the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a wine blogger, wine writer. I, um, I, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm an author of uh, Tapping the Hudson Valley, and I'm a restaurateur and own a restaurant in North Wildwood, New Jersey, called Trio North Wildwood. And I probably forgot something out, but it probably isn't important. <laughs> <laughs> and I am your co-host, Lori. My husband and I own Dracina Wines in Paso Robles, where we specialize in Cabernet Franc. I am also a wine writer under Exploring the Wine Glass, and we are excited to be here And we're going to get right into the interview and tasting as soon as we hear from Elmo. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We think that both Debbie and I agree that wine should be easy for people to enjoy, lighthearted, no snobbiness, just fun, get down to it. And kind of Elmo kind of has that opinion also. (laughs) So there we go. All right. Deb, you want to start it off? Um, sure. What am I? I'm Debbie Giaquindo. What am I starting off with? (laughs) Okay, you lead it. So we're we are here to talk about uh, Torello. Okay. So um, the first thing that we usually always ask is just the the you know the background, how the person who we're interviewing got into the wine industry. So Rick, if you want to go first and just give us a little background about yourself, how you fell in love with wine, and really. I mean, you are specialized into into Spanish wine. So how did that love and background come together? So um, I'm in my fourth career at this point. Um, and uh, my, my love for Spanish wine really kind of came 
about uh, 15 years ago. Um, my, my grandfather is from Barcelona. And so I am actually part Catalan. And um, I was writing a blog while I was working as a corporate banker. And so I know I'm throwing all these things out and everybody's going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, so I was a banker for 20 years. And um, about three and a half years ago, I got the opportunity with the Wine Scholar Guild to create the Spanish Wine Scholar Program, uh, the study and certification program. And so I left a, my banking career and went to work full time in the wine business. And now um, I can say that I actually am living my dream and um, the passion for, for Spanish wine continues to grow every day I get to talk about it and, and throughout my travels around Spain. And we are grateful for that yeah. because when we started talking about a Spanish grape variety, I knew where to go. I went right <laughs> to you. <laughs> okay. And Ignacio, how about you? How did you get into the wine game? Then uh, my family has been working and vine growing on the same place that me from 1,405. I'm the 23rd generation vine growing. And we... <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. We need to back up and repeat that. <laughs> yes. Uh, more than 600 years, my family has been vine growing on the same place, on the same vineyards. And <laughs> That's incredible. That really <laughs> is absolutely incredible. And looks like young, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. we have a long tradition on, on buying growing. And I think that in my DNA, we have <laughs> Charello inside, no? And especially on the region, we, we, are, we fell in love uh, with, the, with the passion of our family working there. And this is the reason why I decided to continue the tradition to work the pioneers and start winemaking because. Uh, we start bottling wine making in 2010 because before my family has been selling the grapes and uh, selling wine, but not bottled. Yeah? They were selling. And from 2010, I arrived to the state and my father stopped buying growing and I started buying growing and I decided to start wine making with the, the plots that we have. So do you still you sell your grapes as well? Uh, we, we are managing 30 hectares of vineyard and we are using 12 for us and we are selling grapes to another wineries yet. Mm -hmm. That is that is so amazing because I like for us to hear a fourth generation is such a big deal. <laughs> so that 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 is I, the oldest I've heard of a gen of generations that are just involved in the in the wine world. It is it is mind blowing and phenomenal. So we are I, I'm honored to have you yes. here and to share your your knowledge and experiences with us. And it's pretty amazing. The same plot of land, family, and just the history. You can't get that anywhere. I mean, such rich history. And Rick, thank you so much because yes. you're the person who made this connection. So thank Absolutely. you for, for getting this for us. Um, you're welcome. Right, so let's get into Charello. So first, <laughs> we want to make sure that everybody knows how to pronounce it because it, it is also a unique spelling, right? We see it mm -hmm. in a couple of different ways. We see it X-A-R-E-L-D-A-L-O, X-A-R-L-Dash-L-O, and then just no da or hyphen. Right. So what what is the correct spelling what is the correct way to say it <laughs> i don't know who wants to answer that one but uh, ignacy since Wait, you're the yeah. since you're the catalan why don't you why don't you tell everybody the the exact pronunciation okay. and i'll and i'll talk about the the spelling part of it in in spanish is is no is charello charello in spanish in catalan is charello is Quite similar, but Finnish in O or in U is the big difference between in Catalan and Spanish, but it's the same. <laughs> yeah, and so the, the interesting thing about the way that it's spelled, because one of the things that I came across when I was researching um, Spanish Wine Scholar um, was just this exact question that you asked. And apparently in Catalan, um, there is a raised dot 
that doesn't exist on most of our keyboards. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually like, it kind of sits a little bit lower than center. And so what ends up happening is you've typically seen the, the dot, you know, like a period in the, in the spelling, uh, the same thing, you know, or, or the dash. I've also seen it without either. And so, um, you know, a lot of times in the legal documents for some of the Catalan um, uh, DOs that use this grape, you will see it multiple ways. Uh, sometimes they will, they will do multiple spellings just so that people, um, there's no question as to what it is. Mm -hmm. All right. So that that does make sense. That's why there's a hyphen in some things, because that would be where that hyphen is pretty much where that that raised the dot. Exactly. The dot. Yeah. Exactly. We use, we use the dot between two L's just to to pronounce to pronounce the L longer. Charello. OK. Ah. No, the, the L is longer. We usually use the, the L dot L. Eh? But it's just to to identify that this L sounds longer that another one it kind of just like rolls off your tongue <laughs> well the other thing too is if you think about it in spanish two l's together are a y sound and so it does force you to realize that it's a harder l charello versus oh, right. charello. and so that would be another reason why you see that distinction like that mm -hmm. oh that's right i didn't even i didn't even think about that but that's true that the double l is a whole different pronunciation Nothing like starting out a, a you know a webinar or a podcast with an etymology, you know, <laughs> lesson. <laughs> but I'm sure so many people. I mean, including myself, when and I look at that. I mean, I I said right off the bat, I know I'm not pronouncing this right. How do you pronounce it? Because I would say exarello, not trello. Oh. Right. Yeah. You know. And then when when I reached out to you, Rick, and I put. I put the the dot, the period, and when you wrote back, I think you did the hyphen or reversed it. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I spelled it wrong and I'm asking. <laughs> you know? So it was good to know that it's kind of accepted all three ways, but now we have a reason for it. So I like it. I like it. There's, right, so there's a, in the in the word Charello, there's, there's a, a famous sentence about a, a, a writer, no? A, during the, the an, an important wedding here in in Catalonia, there was a sorry a periodista. I, I don't know in in, in an, a, a reporter a reporter that was uh, explaining the wedding and uh, she says and for the dinner they are gonna drink uh, wine uh, acaba with macabeo parellada and charel ten. Because in Spanish, in Spanish doesn't exist the like L point L L dot L and Chanel ten, no? Like, like, uh, right. like Chanel. I love it. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, before we get into the actual, like, really get down into learning more about Chanel, it is time to drink. I'm sorry, yes. it's time to drink. So if we can just raise a glass, and the first thing I want to show is the difference between all four of our, our Cherellos, and then maybe uh, we could go a little bit into the wines we have. So I have a still. Debbie, you have? I have a Cava. I have Campo Viejo Cava, which is 40% Cherello. Okay. And, and mine is Morani, it's 2019. Um, Stella Creato, which uh, Ignace knew what it was, so he could talk more about this wine than I can. But I want to show how light it is, okay? Because now mm -hmm. Rick has. I have an orange wine uh, from La Bestia, which is from um, Aleia, which is a small, is one of Spain's smallest wine regions. It's just north of Barcelona. And it's um, in Catalonia, they also call these brisats. Uh, which is which is uh, or the term for orange wine. Mm -hmm. And I have a sweet wine from Viña Singular, it's my winery. It's a sweet wine of the light harvest, a natural sweet wine. We made the harvest on December of 2019. And it's a sweet wine. <laughs> awesome. So well, let's raise a glass. Cheers. 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 Salud. 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 Enjoy. 
All right. So let's so, talk. Go ahead, Deb. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, <clears throat> let's talk about the grape. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were on the same page. Yeah. Um, Michael's here. He was running late. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat. That's why I was oh, spaced okay. out earlier. But um, um, no, go ahead. I'll start off with the question. Um, where is Torello mostly found? Um, is it found just in one region, all over Spain, or and and does anybody outside of Spain grow the grape? So, and this is actually it's funny when you're trying to research where grapes are and everything. It is never easy. Um, the data is either virtually non-existent, um, or you know sometimes it's it's uh, it conflicts with each other. But from what I could find, um, there's about 9,000 hectares of, uh, now this is, and this is a few years, uh, a few years old. And so as Torello continues to grow, especially in the Penedes region, region um, those numbers might be a little bit higher, but about 9,000 hectares and 99% of the grape uh, is grown in Catalonia. It is truly a Catalan grape. Um, when I was doing my research, I did find that there are possibly minuscule plantings of the grape in France and in Chile. But the, uh, in France, they showed, I think this was from wine grapes from Jancis, and it was like 0.1 hectare in France. Um, so, I mean, it, and th that, you know, those, that's always, again, that, that data is a few years old. So they could have been grubbed up at this point and they're gone. But, you know, truly it is, it is a Catalan grape and, and that's, that's where it, it thrives. Mm -hmm. And then, so since we're talking about Catalonia, can, can you tell us where, so somebody who doesn't really know the geography uh, of Spain, like where is it located? And then like, what, it, what is the climate there? Like, how does somebody get there? Give us, give us the lowdown on it. So it's actually, I mean, Catalonia, I think, you know, if you look at Spain, um, Catalonia is is the northeastern kind of triangle of Spain and um, super easy to get to. You fly into Barcelona. Um, the regions that we're talking about right now are basically the, the, the northern, the region that's just north of Barcelona and then the region that's just south of Barcelona. So to get there, it's actually not difficult. Alea is about 30 minute drive from Barcelona and um, the Penedes and Cava regions are um, are about, what, about 45 minutes on the train, Ignacy, yeah, 40, from Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very, I mean, actually quite easy to get to. Climatically, along the coast, you know, more or less, it's, it's mostly Mediterranean. In some of the areas though, um, in Catalonia, when you move in a little bit, um, they can get a little continental and even in Penedes, uh, you can, as you go in, into the more inland areas, you get some hints of, uh, of continental climate, but for the most part, it is predominantly a Mediterranean climate. Okay. Awesome. Okay. And then, um, Ignacy, on your, on your vineyard site, like, what are the soils, what are the soils like? In the Perez Rhine, Rhine uh, in the Perez Rhine region, uh, the soils are... Uh, it's a Perez is a big valley, and uh, the 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 is clay is there. We have there we have a lot of clay there, especially in the region where we are. No, but there are some other places with a little bit of limestone, but it's basically clay, deep soils. But that uh, don't uh, if it rains a lot, the water runs. No, okay, hmm. but it's mostly. Calcarios and clay, eh? calcarios okay. and clay, mm -hmm. okay. where we are, this is this is. And that's, that's, um, so if, if Jarello is the home there in Pitides, then that's really what it likes. That's, that's the soil it grows the, the best mm -hmm. in, that's what it's craving, that type of climate. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, Penedes, uh, Charello grows in, in different parts of Penedes because Penedes has a little, uh, has some, uh, some, some different zones because Penedes goes from the sea to arrives to 30 kilometers inside, 30, 40 kilometers inside. 
and goes from the 20 minutes from Barcelona, uh, one half an hour far away, or one hour far away from Barcelona. It's a quite big region with 30,000 hectares of vineyard, about, about 25, 26,000 hectares of vineyard. And it means that we have the, we have the, the sea, there's the uh, small mountains between the, the center zone of Penedès. There's the center and surrounded by mountains too. But the Charello grows mostly in the part where we are, from the part where we are to the sea, eh? not more inside. Yeah, I read somewhere it doesn't like won't grow well in elevation. It prefers, I guess, like a valley floor rather than up high. I think that, I think that, that uh, grows. Charello is a, is a, uh, we have no problems growing the Charello. Okay. It grows every, everywhere. But the tradition uh, of the region makes that uh, Maccabeo uh, is mostly placed in a zone and Charello a little bit uh, higher and Parellada higher than the other ones. No? But okay. I think that's more a tradition that that uh, situation that doesn't allow the Charello grows in in a, in a high altitude. In fact, uh, Penedès, we go from zero meters up to the sea to 600, but we are okay. mostly at 200 meters. The, the, okay. the, the, big, the big zone is at 200 meters. Right. Is there any disease pressure that you have to worry about on the vines? Mm, in a region, it depends. Every uh, before, <laughs> Every year now we have a, 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 a new problem eh? with the climate, <laughs> with the climate change and everything, because uh, on the last ten years we will we will have a dry dry seasons, uh, very rainy, uh, and then mildew and um, oidium and mildew and but not a lot, but we are not allowed. To uh, we are not uh, used. We don't use to have big pressure with the mildew, especially with the mildew. Mm -hmm. And the last uh, three four years, we suffer a lot for the mildew. Really? But it's quite quite resistant. No, doesn't give us a lot of problems with the diseases at the moment. Um, so going on the mildew that usually isn't there, but unfortunately is now an issue. Are the grape clusters tight? Are are uh, Charello doesn't suffer all the mildew. Last year, yes, 2020, all the <laughs> uh, most of the people lost everything, no, because the mildew, because the pressure was very big. But uh, Charello is an, uh, a grape that suffers a lot the pressure of mildew. If you compare with Macabeo, if you compare with Malvasia de Sitges, with Fumoy, Charello is is more resistant. It's well adapted to the dry climates too. Is better adapted that than other ones, no? Like I told you, like the Macabeo especially, and then is well adapted to the region at the climate that we have. Uh, the average, the rain average that we have on the region is 500 millimeters, average 500, 550. But uh, last year, from October to August, rains just 200, 220 millimeters, and from <coughs> Uh, 15 August to 15 September rains 250 during the harvest, no? The same in one month and during all the year. Wow. Then, and <laughs> we are discovering how to manage uh, every season, no? Mm. I think everybody does because the weather is so changing and it influences, you know, mm. on, on when you pick the grapes, do you pick them early? You know, if there's a storm coming in and you're going to, you know, especially mm. at harvest. So speaking of, of harvesting the grape, is it like early to bud? Is it late to, you know, when do you typically see the bud on it? And then when do you typically would harvest it? Hmm. Um, the, the, the vegetative cycle of Charello starts about uh, 20 of April, 15, 20 of April. And the harvest is four and a half months later. Okay. Eh? About. It means that, for example, this year, I think that uh, started uh, growing the, the leaves, the small leaves, in the 12th of April. And we started the harvest of Charello for wine. Because, as you know, if you if you do the harvest for Cava, you have you do it earlier. 
but for wine we made it about 10 of uh, September. And when would, if you were to make a cava with it, how much mm. earlier, just to show people that, that it would be picked at? Two weeks, two weeks before. Two weeks, okay. Two weeks, 10 days, two weeks before for a cava. Is, is the, 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 the unique difference is the, the gape, the, the uh, alcohol, the uh, degree probably of alcohol that you need mm -hmm. for to make a cava or that you need to make a steel wine. That is the big difference. And depending on the on the hot and depending on the rain or depending on everything, the this uh, sugar grows faster or lower in the grape. Then, but uh, perhaps the, the, in my state, the difference when we pick the grapes for cava and for wine is two weeks. Okay. And since Maybe. Debbie mentioned cava, um, Rick, can you tell us a little bit more? So, uh, Chirello is actually one of three grape varieties that are allowed or that are typically used mm -hmm. in cava. Can you talk about its production in cava and then a little bit about the other grapes and what mm -hmm. cava actually is? Yeah, sure. So, um, Chirello is one of the three indigenous grape, white grapes, that are used in the production of cava. And um, cava is is um, is made uh, the same way that champagne is. It's made in the traditional method uh, with the second fermentation in the bottle. So by all by any you know comparison, cava is more like champagne than it is like prosecco, because prosecco is made in the tank method, and um, but everything here happens within the same bottle. And so uh, much like champagne, you have different aging. Uh, uh, regimes. And um, for example, kava in particular, um, very basic kava requires nine months of aging. Um, and then you do have other levels. Uh, there's a new classification system right now in kava, which is also kind of kicking up the, the aging. So you'll have a reserva at 18 months, you'll have a grand reserva at 30 months, and then you'll have a paraje calificado at 36 months. And so this is, you know, so that's where you see a lot of that similar. Now, a lot of these producers will age quite a bit longer than that. Um, one of the benefits of Charello and Macabeo both is that they both help promote aging. They're both good age-worthy grapes. And so um, the other two grapes that are in the traditional cava blend, which um, I don't know, Debbie, if you have all three in your I do. I do have okay. all three in mine. So you have Macabeo, which is the most planted uh, cava grape. You have Charello, like which is, mm -hmm. is second. And I think you said that one was 40 in yours. Um, Charello was 40 and the other and two then were 30. Pariada, and then Pariada, mm -hmm. which is the least planted of the three cava groups. And they also are authorized um, to put Chardonnay um, in as well, um, as well as Malvasia, but that one's very, very minor in the, in there, but really, truly Cava is a combination of, of typically two to three of those indigenous grapes. Okay. So it doesn't have to be all three. No, it does not. <clears throat> it's just, it's the tradition. I mean, there are the three indigenous grapes when Cava was first created and, um, uh, back in the uh, 1870s, it was actually made using uh, French grapes. And it wasn't until 1888 when uh, the, the first true cava made from indigenous grapes was actually uh, created in, in Spain, in Catalonia. That's interesting. Yeah. Very, very, very interesting. Because I do see some cobs that are also produced with other grapes as well. Yeah, exactly. So that's mm -hmm. where you could have uh, you could have some Chardonnay, you could have mm -hmm. some Alvesia. Then you have the Rosé Cavas, uh, mm -hmm. where you have four red grapes mm -hmm. that are authorized to produce um, uh, produce in there as well. And so one of the the benefits of of Charello in the blend um, is that it does add some ageability. It adds freshness. It adds body. There's acidity to it, and it's one of the reasons why it's such a incredibly versatile grape. Um, I don't, I, I can honestly say I have never seen pareada done in a sweet, a sparkling, a white, and an orange wine, you know? Um, Macabeo, I would say people have tried it, I'm sure, because it is the most planted grape. But Chorello really adds so much to the cava blend. 
Do we know yeah. the parents? Oh, of, oh. Yeah, I was, I'm just, I'm blown away that by complete chance, because it wasn't planned. No. Now, no. We have four people on the podcast and we have four different expressions of the same grief. And so I can't wait to go dive into that a little bit more. But go ahead, Deb. I, you totally lost my train of thought. I was no, I, ask I got you. your question, Debbie. It is um, the, pa the parents. Yes, the parents are. Was the genetics? And, and I love it's funny because going through and researching this this particular question, um, because I'm always fascinated as to how mm -hmm. grapes become great. You know who they yeah. are, mm -hmm. and so um, so the male progenitor uh, grape is a grape a grape called Brustiano Fo. It is a French grape that is no longer around, um, and the female progenitor grape is a Spanish grape called Jerez, which is also Gibi from North Africa, but it is, it is an Andal in Andalusia, it is a huge Spanish table grape. What's even more fascinating was these same two grapes are the parents of also Macabeo. So two parents of the same two grapes created Charello and the same two created Macabeo. And all I could think of was, was like, my sister and I have the same parents and we're completely different people. And how did that happen? You know? Exactly. So how does that happen? I don't know. It's absolutely <laughs> fascinating how like certain genetics within a vine will, I mean, I am assuming will, you know, I am, I am by no means, by no stretch of the imagination, um, you know, a, a viticulture. So I, I, you know, or a DNA analyst when it comes to this, but I thought it was fascinating that those two grapes, um, and also, so the Andalusian table grape is also the, uh, one of the parent grapes of Aiden, which is the most planted grape in Spain, also a white grape that's predominantly used for brandy, as well as Pedro Jimenez. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and all natural crossings, all natural crossings. As no, far no. as I know, yes, yes. Wow. wow. I wonder if the field where they crossed and made, um, Mancibo, does that, I probably Mac pronounce Macabeo. Macabeo. I wonder if the soils and elevation had anything to do with it. It, it could. I mean, that, I mean, that, I, that I, might be, maybe we do that for M for season three. Yeah. <laughs> we research that. So, so my, so again, microbiologist, a lot of genetics in my undergrad work. Like my brain is going Punnett square and what is a dominant gene and what's a, a recessive gene in the grapes mm -hmm. and um, just how, how that's, how that works. Like there's gotta be recessive, recessive traits within both of those vines where in one situation it crossed and it occur it happened. And then in the other situation, the two recessive genes came together or just like we can have, and I hate to, related to this, but it's the easiest way to say it, just how humans can have birth defects because of a spontaneous mutation during the, the conception, basically, where the, the DNA just mutates a little, it just mutated, you know, sp spontaneously at that time. So, oh, I, my, my science brain yeah. is <laughs> going. Oh. I just thought it was fascinating though. I mean, the more I started researching it, the more I kept digging. You know, yeah, you go down these rabbit holes. I know. I knew the answer already, but I'm like, oh my gosh, this is fascinating. So, I, I wonder, are you aware of any other situation where that has occurred? Where, I mean, you know, we have lots of grape varieties that are, you know, like Cab Franc is the parent of a lot, you know, of several different grape varieties, but it's different. It's got a different mate. Are you aware of any other situation where we have the two same two parents for a different? I'm not. I'm not, but I haven't done a lot of research to be fair. Um, I mean, I'm sure it, it, if it's happened once, it's very likely happened again. Um, but it, it I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know. And you've heard it first on Wine for Bed Street. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so going, going, moving forward with that same type of thing. So uh, Chirello supposedly I had read has health benefits. And what does it have that the other grape varieties don't? So, I mean, I, I won't say that other grape varieties don't have it, but these are kind of, these are two of the things that are actually um, 
quite positive um, mm -hmm. is number one, it's, it's, it has thick skins and the skins are high in polyphenols. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these are the types of things that are helped to boost your digestion. Uh, they're supposedly good for brain health, which I'm like, you know, drink more. This is good for my brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it's also very high in the antioxidant resveratrol. Um, Interesting. And so, you know, this is something that helps to lower blood pressure. Um, it can have a positive effect on cholesterol levels. Um, so, and it's I, a white that, skin grape. It's a white it, skin grape. Yeah, it is a white skin grape, grape. But there is also, um, interestingly enough, and I don't know, Ignacy, if you work with this or not, there is also a pink skinned uh, mm -hmm. version of this grape uh, called um, uh, Charello Rechale. Rosado. Recharello, Recharello in here. We say red and, is pink, but it's pink. The skin, the skin color is pink, and it's very difficult to to get a pink wine with this grape. Some some years we get it, but but not always. I don't know why, but not always. It depends on the the season, depends on the grapes, but every season is different. And but it's yes. really super small production. Um, the okay. other thing I want to point out too, because a lot of times if people are looking at, you know, looking at bottles and reading. Grapes. So we're talking about Charello, um, and, and you know, and this is the way that they refer to the grape in Penedes. But in, for example, in the wine I'm drinking, uh, this is from Alea, from the region north, and they refer to Charello, the clone of Charello that they use, as Panza Blanca. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's it's the same. You know, there they may be a clone of each other, but they are synonyms for each other. Um, and, and then that pink skin grape that we're talking about. Um, they also call it panza rosada. So they, they have their own, you know, um, nomenclature for mm -hmm. for the same grape. So if you do happen to look and see panza blanca, it's also referred to as panza in places like Monsant and Priorat. Uh, and even in the Dio Catalunya, the larger Dio, it's referred to as Cartoicha. Um, so it, it's got a lot of names, but Traditionally, you know, especially when you see, you know, these grapes and this, the wines in the U.S., you typically see them as Charello or Panza Blanca. Mm -hmm. Cartuja is mostly used in the south of Penedes wine region, in Tarragona province, but is most used there. Because, in fact, uh, yes, Charello, you can find Charello in all the Catalonia, but more than 90% is in the Penedes in, and all the surrounders of Penedes. Uh, in the north of in the north of Barcelona in Alella, there are a, a little, but just a little, because there are a few vineyards there, not not a lot. And there are some 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 like Charello too in Balearic Islands too. Uh, the name is Premsal también. Mm -hmm. Is a as Rick explained, is a nomenclature name, but it's quite similar. The difference is the climate and the water, and uh, <laughs> especially the climate. And the soils are also different, especially when you're looking at the Balearic Islands, because the Balearic mm -hmm. Islands are predominantly limestone with um, a subsoil. And in La Mallorca, for example, you might have these huge rocks in the western part. And on the eastern part, you have this red clay. Um, so, yeah, but but to Ignacio's point, I mean, you know, and, and to be fair, the Balearic Islands you used to be, you know, kind of Catalan territory at one point in time anyway. So... Um, it, 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 it truly is a grape that has, that's kind of found its, its way around the, you know, its region, its own region. Mm -hmm. Um, shall we share what Tiffany has uh, mentioned here in the chat about, uh, cava well, grapes? Um, she wrote that Frégenet has a winery in the, and yeah, yeah, and they grow cava grapes. So they must, mm -hmm. they must grow the three grapes. Interesting. Mm. So, yeah, so well, the thing is, is they can't technically call it cava yeah. if it's in Mexico right. because cava right. is a protected DO. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I would be very curious to know, if, you know, what they uh, what they're growing there, because, you know, these you know, it's interesting when you see these grapes um, because um, uh, Frejanet. Um, I'm trying to think. There are a couple of, of Spanish cava producers that actually have wineries in California. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, they're making sparkling wines 
you know, in a very, in the same method, but. Right. And Tiffany just confirmed, she's like, yes, they don't call it kava, they just call it sparkling yeah, wine. Sparkling wine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Ignacy, going going back to, to like geeking out a bit, um, the the grape vines, when you're when you're maintaining your vines, like is Cherello a vigorous grape? Like, do you have to worry about the balance of vegetative versus reproductive? Are you do you need to do green drop? Um like, or is it kind of an easy to, you, you talked about it, the, the disease resistance aspect of it, mm. but what about it's just growth aspect? What are you mm. looking for to be a healthy vine? See, well, uh, we are doing everything you, you say, you say, you know, the, the, the green, the green, har the green harvest, we, the green uh, pruning, we do everything because, uh, I think that's the best way to get the best grape you need to make wine, no? But Charello doesn't need it. Uh, that doesn't need that you take the leaves because the humidity doesn't affect a lot. The the, the, the skin is, is quite uh, resistant to everything and, and you don't have a big problem with the diseases. But uh, depending on uh, the way you manage the, the plots, you can get uh, a quite big production, not such big as Macabeo. Macabeo is bigger production than the Charello, but uh, Charello is, is it quite, it depending on the, uh, the managing you are making. On the conventional farming, um, is you can get uh, Charello. We don't get a lot because we are making on the, we are working on the regenerative agriculture, uh, you know, Regenerative is quite different farm type of farming, and we are producing 2,000, 3,000 kilos hectare. But <laughs> our neighbors are producing 12, 15,000 kilos hectare, but we are working in another way. <laughs> then I, I don't know. What I see is that they, they produce a lot of grape, not me. <laughs> so that goes to show that it can be a workhorse. And that's probably why we can see it in so many different expressions is that winemakers, uh, you know, farmers like you who are picking it and choosing the best qualities of it to produce a single variety or the late harvest or something like that. And then I'm, I'm guessing and correct me if I'm wrong, if it's going into a cava or it's going into a larger blend, you you're not so necessarily concerned about that excellent quality because it's mm -hmm. it's being blended if i mm -hmm. on the right track wrong track <laughs> no no i mean I, I would i would probably say i mean there's there's definitely a lot of truth to that Lori, for sure but i think when you start to look at some of the really top producers um that doesn't become as much of a concern they're more concerned about the quality of every grape that goes in because it's a reflection of the of the wine that they're producing um but to your point um and like he said macabeo is also a productive grape so you get you know that's why you see a lot of cava that is mass produced um mm -hmm. So, it, you know, the, I mean, but they're not controlling yields. They're not, you know, dropping, they're not dropping green berries, mm -hmm. not doing any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, now that we, we have, you know, four different types of, of wine made by this, this one grape, I mean, we usually talk about like food pairings and things, but I think we really need to talk about each of our wines. I mean, cause they're all so different. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, well, I mean, every I, everybody I'm sure has had a cava. So I'll go last because I think the three <laughs> of you are your your wines, um, you know, are so different. And, you know. What? So I, I'll go first, because probably if we're following that concept, mm -hmm. um, Ignacy, I think yours is the most unique because it's the late harvest. And then mm -hmm. I, I think Rick, yours is more special. Not that this isn't special, but yours is more special because it's an orange wine. So it's a different process. Um, but I, I have a still wine and in all honesty, I don't know very much about this. Um, 
Ignacy, you had recognized the label, so maybe you can talk about mm -hmm. the, the the wine itself. Um, I had never had a, a, a varietal Torello, so it's it's interesting, and I'm I'm kind of a little baffled to to describe it because it's it's multi-dimensional going on here. Um, the the aromas are kind of a snow a stone fruit, um, but the I kind of expected, and then Rick, you alluded to, like, I kind of expected a, a higher acid wine, but this isn't to me a high acid, and it kind of has a more um, Riesling concept to me than, than what I had in my head. And I don't know where I got anything in my head prior to drinking it, but it's more a lot, like there's, like I'm almost a petrol to it. And I wasn't expecting that. So either one of you can tell me if I'm out of my mind or if that is difficult. <laughs> or... <laughs> so it's, it's not usual that petrol flavor to the charello is unusual. I have, I'm managing I'm managing more more than twenty plots of charello of twenty plots of different and every plot is different. I have one. I'm making eight or nine different wines with charello. Uh, sparkling and steel wines and all are different this is the reason why i make the nine different wines no because all are different and the ripeness is different and everything is different and i have one that uh, the flavor is like the like a riesling like i told you like petrol like uh, uh, hydrocarburos you can smell it but it's very unusual to find it i i don't i don't know this one because i tasted it a long time ago that the first the first harvest of this wine I, I, I didn't repeat it because I had no the possibility to, to retaste, no? But it's possible, but it's unusual. Okay. It's more like, so, and it's also more on the palate. Um, it's more of like a, a, a Viognier. It's, it's, it's kind of, it coats the palate more than zings the palate. So what, if somebody, maybe Rick, you can, you know, talk about this a little bit more. If somebody is, purchasing a bottle of single varietal Torello, what should they be expecting? Like what, I mean, I know Nessie just said it comes in different types, but like uh, what we can see here in the United States, what should yeah. they expect? Yeah, I think, I think the wine that you have, Lori, is probably fairly representative of varietal still, um, you know, stainless steel produced Torello. And I mean, it does, Torello does tend to add, remember we talked about the fact that it adds body to the, that's kind of those Viognier aspects that you're talking about where it's mouth coating. Um, it also tends to have a little bit of a waxy texture to it um, as well, but it does, from what I've seen, it tends to be in like the medium, medium plus acid, you know, range. So um, I think that that's, you know, which in my opinion makes it a quite versatile uh, wine for food. Um, I mean, I think about Thanksgiving coming up and I think that you know, the, the four wines that we have, you could basically run the entire meal um, <laughs> on the Thanksgiving table, which I think is super cool. You can't do that with a lot of wines. Okay. And so, um, I mean, because yours is kind of that, you know, obviously you start with, with, with Deb's Cava and then you go into the first courses and you're drinking the one that Lori's drinking and then uh, the Brissat for more of the turkey and the, you know, those types of things. So, it's one of the things I love about this grape is that it's so incredibly versatile. It is. I, it, is. it is. It is. So, Rick, why don't you talk about your your wine itself? Yeah, sure. So, again, I mean, color-wise, uh, I'm just, you know, it's fascinating when you pour this. So, this is um, this is Panza Blanca from Alea, um, and this was the La Bestia. Uh, from Alea, from uh, Oriol Artigas. And uh, so this is 12 days on the skins, which is quite That's lengthy a for mm -hmm. a white wine, and uh, and then 10 months on the leaves. And oh. so uh, bottled, unfined, unfiltered, the whole thing. So it is like truly brisat, orange wine, natural wine, whatever you want to call them. Um, and so... The very first moment that I first opened the bottle and I put my nose in the glass, I got like this apple cider, you know, kind of a note. And then and then what's end up happening is it just keeps, you know, evolving. And so it's got really neat saline notes. 
Um, it's got uh, some stone fruit. Uh, there's definitely some lemon, a little bit of like herb, herbal kind of like uh, like garig a little bit. And it's just, it's really, truly, and it's not for everybody. And then I will always admit that orange wines, you know, um, are always, they take a little time for most people to actually kind of get into because the first time you taste tannin on a white wine, it always kind of blows your mind a little bit, you know? Um, but for this one here, the tannins are still quite, you know, I would call a medium minus, um, they're not, I mean, it's definitely just more of that textural um, complexity that you get with this particular wine versus having, you know, a, um, a, a white, you know, a, an orange wine that has really, you know, massive tannin. Like, I mean, some of the wines that I've had from Georgia, you know, I still find it hard sometimes to kind of get through some of those wines. But this one is just absolutely spectacular. It's a beautiful expression of this grape in a d very different way. And now I'm so excited, Ignace, yeah. to, to hear about your wine. But can you give us a little bit more, a little bit more background on since you've been making wine, a little bit more about your winery and how is it available in the United States? Because if it is, we want to be able to get our hands on it. Mm -hmm. And then tell us about your wine. Okay, then as I told you, my winery is a very, is a very small winery. We are just producing between 35 and 40,000 bottles per year. And it's placed in the middle of the Peninsula region in our family house in the countryside. And has just 70 square meters. It's very, very small. And we make there 33 different wines. <laughs> <laughs> we have all, the, like all the letters of the alphabet. We have all the, all the letters of the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we are managing 12 different grapes, all indigenous grapes, and we make uh, a wine from every plot. And we make a sparkling sped nuts, you know, just farm fermentation, ancestral method, and still wines, white, rosés, uh, claretes, uh, whites macerated with uh, red skins. Um, too much thing, too much thing. How are you awake right now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> no, this season is so quiet now. <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah, to watch I know that's what I'm saying. You need to catch up on your sleep right now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but now this season is, is uh, we are waiting to bottle because now we have a few wine from the available now from the last harvest and. Uh, well, it's, we do what we feel, what we love, and we enjoy doing it. And we make a lot of wines because once a time an, an old man asked me, okay, uh, how old are you? I, I was 40, and now I'm 45. No, I, I was 40, and, and he told me, okay, then if you are 40, if you are a farmer, you can be working, you can be retired at 70, not more because you will be totally broken. And he said to me, you just have 30 opportunities on your life to make wine because you have one opportunity per year. And then I recommend you that make as much wines as you want every year because if not, you are losing a wine, a complete wine and an opportunity to make it. And this is the reason why we decided to make what we feel. We, we make a lot of wines. We make field blend wines uh, too because... All the all the plots that we are planting now are are mixed great are mixed uh, vines and we pick the grapes all together and we make the wine comes the coupage is, is a great coupage that comes from the vineyard and we make <laughs> that was work, great advice we work in clay amphoras mm -hmm. we work in chestnut barrels uh, inox in demi johns we work wow in the style chestnut barrels that's awesome. Different style. Yeah, chestnut. We just work with chestnut, big, big uh, chestnut barrels from 500 to 1,000 liters. Wow. Hmm. That was great advice that man gave you. <laughs> that was really great advice. Yeah. Don't miss out. So tell us about what you have in your glass. Okay, what we have in, your, in our glass is a, is a wine that we just made once a time on 2019. Uh, I, I think that we won't repeat never. 
because it's very difficult to make it. And because in the region where we are, it's very difficult to make a wine on this way, because usually after the harvest starts raining a lot and it's not possible to keep the grapes on the plant and get the dry grapes and a little bit of botrytis, no? Mm -hmm. uh, usually is acid botrytis if you left the grapes in the in the vine and you can use it and it's a natural sweet wine we picked the grapes between november and december of 2019 in every two weeks we went to the vineyard and picked some grapes and we finished the harvest on 23rd of december wow. is a it's just nine and a half alcohol degrees 220 grams of sugar that comes from the grape is sugar not fermented and is fermented in inox and then is aged in a demi joans of 54 liters and we bottle when we have an order we bottle one demi joan 100 bottles and when it's finished we bottle the other one and it means that now we just bottled uh, three and we have five more it means that we will have wine for <laughs> for a long time yet <laughs> That that's actually brilliant to like yeah. bottle the whole thing it, it, when it's this, when it's when it's a late harvest it it can you know like it can sit there and not really you know you you don't need to bottle everything at the same time that, that that's actually brilliant all at once yeah. yeah so do you just sell this particular wine out of your winery uh, see I drink a lot of this wine oh so but... you do, it, it's for yourself <laughs> <laughs> we, we got this now we got this now. <laughs> I so try, if you're I out of your stock, you bottle more. We got it. <laughs> I, try, I try to sell some bottles. <laughs> in USA, uh, uh, I, have a, I have an importer in, in Virginia, in Richmond, that is representing us in all USA. And now we are selling in Virginia, in D.C., and then we are selling in uh, Washington State, in New York, in Arizona, and Miami, and that's all. And we sent, I think that we sent it 24 bottles of this wine to USA. <laughs> then good luck, good luck. <laughs> if you wanna, if you wanna find one. <laughs> ah, we we need that connection. Yes. We, we need to call and say, well, we spoke to Ignacy, and I don't know. He said we can get said, a bottle. He said you got 24. What happened to them all? Where'd yeah. they all go? <laughs> The name of the company is Native Selections. Native Selections. It's place, so. it's place it in Richmond. It's a okay. good friend. <laughs> this January, he's going to come to visit us. He comes twice a year here to Peredes and stay mm -hmm. at home with me. And I usually come to USA once a time a year to visit okay. him and some customers too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if you come to the USA, we can do a wine dinner yeah, at yeah. our restaurant. Why not? <laughs> yeah, or here. absolutely. I love absolutely. traveling. I love uh, discover new places, meet new people, and is <laughs> for me is something uh, good. Of if, yeah. if perhaps the best of winemaking is mm -hmm. travel a lot is what I try to do. We are we are selling this year. We sold uh, more than eighty percent of the production outside Spain. Oh, that's wow. great! Wow, and wow. because. We love traveling and we we meet, we meet a lot of people everywhere and good friends and <laughs> it's what we do. And talking about the wine, I think that Charello is a good grape to make a, a sweet wine because it has a good acidity that is uh, sometimes a, a sweet wine with 20, 120, or two, 220 grams of sugar is heavy, is no, but with acidity of the Charello that is concentrated, losing the water because it's dry, dry grapes. Uh, the, the, in this case, keeps the acidity, yeah? and then as we work with no sulfur too, we have a little bit of volatile acidity. It's quite normal in the sweet wines too, in the sweet natural wines, and it's very fresh. Tastes like honey too, but very fresh. Nice. All right, so we need to get so, a hand on one of those twenty-four bottles. We do. <laughs> Maybe someone in New York City has it. Yeah, we'll have to check it out. Yes. So I have. Campo Fajijo Cava. And it's funny, I wish um, I knew I was going to be drinking this because I was at a Spanish wine tasting um, last Monday 
in Rick was there uh, Mercado. Too. At Great Match. Were you there? Yeah. Yeah, I was there. I didn't see. I went to the Canary Island seminar. So did I. The volcanic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about that? But I was talking with the um, the woman that was there for from this winery um, for a while on a wine dinner issue or idea. Anyway, um, this is great to start any day or anything with. Um, we're actually having a bubbles and birds dinner at our restaurant in a couple of weeks. And this is wine is going to be paired with one of our um, courses. It's very fresh. Got a hint of um, brioche. Maybe some citrus on the nose. Mm, it is really lovely. And I have to say, um, as I've been tasting this during the different stages that we've been on this webinar, I've gotten different flavors. Um, midway through, I got some grapefruit and some peach. And now the peach is more gone and it's more citrusy as it's been, been warming up. So it's, I think it's really interesting to see how, you know, a wine changes from coming out of the fridge. So it's been out of the fridge now for just over an hour, you know, in the glass. Mm. Definitely more citrus, but it is really... It's, um, you know, not the acidity was, is probably maybe medium, um, but it's really, it's really lovely. And it's almost five o'clock. So when I, then I can finish the rest of the bottle. <laughs> and then just as a reference point, my bottle, thank you, Rick, for finding it for me. Mine was $16. I, I literally had to pay more for shipping than I paid for the bottle. So that made me buy two bottles because it was 10 cents more to ship me two bottles than one bottle. I will tell you that mine, um, my husband, I think, paid 12 or $13 for it. But the SRP is $10.99. Okay. Yeah. And so. Rick, what about... what about the uh, Mine is in the 50 to $55 range. So again, it shows it shows that you can get this grape variety across the spectrum of of expression and and wallet. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes, and, and when absolutely. you think about so, the the twelve days on skins and the lees and all that, it explains why it is a more expensive. It, it it's also just so you know, this is bottle number twenty six of two thousand and eighty bottles. Oh, and no, an actual numbered bottle. That yeah, oh. I mean, literally, they put it on the back of the. Of Very the cool. I like uh, when people do that. Yeah. So wow. this, no, this and, goes. And the yeah. vineyards, if you visit the vineyards that uh, own Oriol Artigas in Alella, you will understand uh, the price because it's a uh, heroic uh, farming there. Mm. Yeah. They are working all by hand, no tractors. Uh, it's very, very hard to work there and very old vines and i think that's the difference <laughs> the big difference is about the the low production and very hard work there mm -hmm. and usually we talk about the different food pairings with with the grape but since this grape is produced in here four different different ways i mean we have tons of food that this could, could be paired with anywhere from you know the beginning of the meal to the end of the meal to to dessert i mean i'm your, the, the sweeter wine would be great with an apple pie. Yeah, so that was going to be my question, Nasi. What yeah. do you like to eat? What do you like to eat with that? Or are you just enjoying it as a as the end of the evening? With the, with this wine? Yes. I love this wine with foie, with foie, mm -hmm. with uh, blue cheese. Too. Blue cheese, I can see that. Yep, cheese. Yep. Like the cava, like cava igual with cheese, and but I never. Uh, drink this wine with sweet food too, because it's too sweet mm. for me. Too sweet. <laughs> I prefer the contrast between like sweet that? and dry and yeah. And so we we are um, at our hour and we try not to uh, take up too much time of our guests. So, but Ignacy, before we go, is 
can people come visit your winery? Are you open for visitors? Yes, of course. We, well, uh, we have no uh, visitor center, but if you come from USA, all, all of you are welcome. Uh, I have no website, but if you look for me in Instagram, uh, you can send me a message. A lot of the people that contact me comes from Instagram. Vinya Singulars in Instagram. Okay. You can find me. And everybody is welcome at the winery. <laughs> and we will enjoy some time together there. I will see you in February, um, okay. Ignasi. I'm coming to Barcelona for Barcelona Wine Week. So ah, okay, I'm I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. And Rick, I just give me one second. I want to put this up. Um, and you can tell us a little bit more about how people can learn more about um, about the Spanish Wine Guild. And this is Isn't not working, Deb, but it's not sharing. <laughs> it says stop sharing. Yeah, no, but you're not seeing it, are you? <laughs> no. I can talk it's... about it, Lori. It's fine. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I work with the Wine Scholar Guild and I created a program. Our, our organization works with the wines of France, Italy, and Spain. And I wrote the, the program for Spain. Uh, it's called Spanish Wine Scholar. And um, basically what it is, it's an in, in tremendously in-depth course on the wines, wine regions of Spain. We cover every wine uh, region in Spain. The manual um, itself is over 300 pages. It's really a great reference manual. It's the most in-depth resource on the wines of Spain um, that you can find. And so um, I teach the course online um, through the Wine Scholar Guild. Uh, you can find that if you go to Instagram at Wine Scholar Guild, or you can also find it on my Instagram uh, where I am the Spanish wine guy. Um, and so um, always, you know, and you're welcome. As just as Ignacy said, if you ever have questions, uh, just feel free to message me and I can get you more information. But if you go to the winescholarguild.org, winescholarguild.org, uh, you will see uh, the next online class starts uh, middle of February. And I'll be teaching that as well, so. And I did just go to the site, so I'm going to put that link into the chat and be sure to put the information into the post when we post it. Um, uh, oh, and... and Ignacy did put his um oh his, his Instagram. Instagram. Yep. Um, and yep. we'll include that also. And Rick Jean is here and uh they're stating that your course is incredible with two exclamation points. Thanks, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Completely unsolicited, everybody else. Um, unsolicited. Completely Thank unsolicited. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so um I I would like to thank you both for yes. taking your time out and sharing your knowledge and expertise. And it was wonderful to see you both here. And um, thank you for sharing all of this with us and our listeners and our blog readers. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys. It's been an incredible hour. Thank you. And Rick, I wish I knew you were in New York. I would have loved to I meet you. I did too. <laughs> I'll be, I go every year, Deb. So I'll be there. Next okay. Year I'll, I'll see you next year. All right. Or if not sooner. Cheers, Absolutely. everyone. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Wine from Bed Street on Chirello. Um, it's a pretty amazing grape, and just so that you know, we all did not talk to each other on what we were bringing to this episode, so it was pretty amazing. I had no idea it was produced in a still orange and late harvest, so it was pretty, pretty amazing that uh, we learned that and uh, got to show you the different ways that the grape that is produced. So I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, and you can find me at HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, and you can email me with any questions or suggestions at Debbie at HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com. Have a great day.